Congregation, this is indeed the day that the Lord has made. Let us therefore rejoice and be glad in it. We warmly welcome uh, the congregation as we assemble ourselves together for worship, but we also want to welcome those who are visiting this morning, uh, perhaps as family over this holiday season. We are thankful that God in His providence has given us the opportunity to call upon the name of our Lord together in public worship. Our call to worship this morning is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Uh, There John sees every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them. I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen, and the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. And that is also our privileged responsibility this morning, uh, to humble ourselves and to worship him who lives forever and ever. As we begin to do so, uh, let's open our service with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, uh, we are confronted with the powerful display of your majesty as another day dawns, and we are reminded from your word that you are the one only true God, the God who lives forever and ever. And so we come into your presence this morning, and we ask for the proper spirit of a humble faith as we bow down in our hearts and as we seek to worship you. We pray, Father, that through all of the elements of this service, that blessing and honor and glory and power may be ascribed to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll begin our service with song. If you'll take the Trinity Psalter hymnal and turn to selection 375. If Abel will stand as we sing stanzas 1, 2, and then stanzas 5 and 6. So 1, 2, 5, and 6 of 375.
As we gather together this morning, we do so confessing that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heaven and who has also made the earth. And he greets us this morning with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our service by giving our attention to the reading of God's will for our lives as we find that recorded and expressed in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. We read there that God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates." For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet neighbor's house. You shall not covet neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And these Ten Commandments are summarized by our Lord in the New Testament as being two. The first and the great commandment is that we are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is likened to the first. We are called to love our neighbor as ourself. Uh, We'll respond to hearing the Lord speak to us His will for our lives by turning together in our Trinity Psalter hymnal to selection 51C. We'll remain seated, but we'll sing stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 8. So the first three and the last stanza of 51C.
The exercise of our faith, the faith that receives the Lord Jesus Christ, the faith that also then brings about justification, uh, the exercise of our faith is focused upon the promises of God as those promises are revealed in Holy Scripture. And so as we go through the dialogue of corporate worship, having confessed our sins through song, we also now hear our Lord speak to us uh, a word of assurance from 1 John 1, uh, verse 8 and following. Uh, There John writes, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And may the hearts of God's people find comfort in the promise that is contained within that passage of Scripture. This morning we have the opportunity to hear a public profession of faith from Jack Anderson. So at this time in the service, Jack, I would invite you to come forward here so that we can hear your profession of faith. We have a form for this in the Forms and Prayers book on page 16 if you want to follow along. Uh, And the form uh, asks four questions uh, for Jack to answer and also then uh, gives the words for a charge to be given uh, to Jack and then also a prayer. The prayer part uh, we'll have after the the singing of a song and we'll incorporate that into our congregational prayer. Jack, we indeed do thank our God concerning you. For the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus, we praise Him for working faith in your heart so that you now desire publicly to profess your faith in the presence of God and His holy church and enter into the privileges of full communion with the people of God. Jack, you are now requested to answer sincerely the following questions. First, do you wholeheartedly believe the doctrine contained in the Old and the New Testament and in the articles of the Christian faith, and taught here in this Christian church to be the true and complete doctrine of salvation, and do you promise by the grace of God to continue steadfastly in this profession? I do. Secondly, do you openly accept God's covenant promise, which has been signified and sealed to you in your baptism, and do you confess that you despise and humble yourself before God because of your sins, and that you seek your life, not in yourself, but only in Jesus Christ, your Savior. I do. Do you declare that you love the Lord, and that it is your heartfelt desire to serve Him according to His word, to forsake the world, to put to death your old nature, and to lead a godly life? I do. And finally, do you profess, do you promise to submit to the government of the church, and also if you should become wayward, either in doctrine or in life, to submit to its admonition and discipline. I do. Having answered those questions, Jack, I now give you this charge. I charge you then, beloved, by the diligent use of the means of grace and with the assistance of your God to continue in the profession that you have just made. In the name of Christ Jesus our Lord, I now welcome you to full communion with the people of God. Rest assured that all the privileges of such communion are now yours. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Also, Jack, allow me a personal word of encouragement and exhortation. Uh, We are indeed glad that the Lord has worked in your life to this point where you come and you make profession of faith. Every single member of the church is vitally important, uh, but there's especially uh, a need for young men of conviction, uh, young men in the church who have uh, an understanding of the Scriptures, uh, young men in the church who have a commitment to the Scriptures, Uh, young men to be faithful fathers, uh, loving their wives, Uh, young men to lead their homes in the way of the Lord, Uh, young men also to take up an active role uh, in the church. Uh, And so we are thankful to the Lord, and we are encouraged by your profession of faith. 
Uh, our hope and our prayer for you is that the Lord would continue to bless you with all that you need, that you could uh, lead uh, your own life well, that you can lead uh, your, your dear wife well, your family well. And if the Lord's will is in due time, that you would also uh, lead within the church uh, here as uh, perhaps an office bearer someday down the road. Uh, the church needs young men, and so we're thankful that the Lord has brought you to our uh, midst and that he's given you the grace to profess your faith. Blessings. I do have a certificate here for you, and then you may be seated. Thank you. At this point, then, congregation will sing a song in response to hearing uh, the profession of faith. And in this song, we, we all, in a way, uh, profess our faith. Uh, the song that we've selected is 89B. Uh, we'll stand, if able, as we sing stanzas 1, 3, and then 7 and 9. 1, 3, 7, and 9 of 89B, after which you may be seated again. Let's then pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that from the very beginning you have embraced children within your covenant together with their parents. We thank you that from the first you have included uh, Jack, your servant, in the Christian church and granted him, along with all of us, the many blessings of the covenant community. We praise you that in Jack's case you added the special grace of your Holy Spirit that of his own will, he came here today to profess your truth and to consecrate his life to your service. We earnestly pray that you will continue to carry on the good work that you have begun in Jack and in all of us until the day of complete redemption. Increase in us daily the many gifts of your grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. I grant us the happiness of promoting the glory of our Lord and the edification of your people. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would deliver us in the temptations of this life and especially in the final trial of death. And in that day when you make up your jewels, uh, set also Jack and all of us, your servants, within your crown, that we may shine as stars to your praise forever and ever. And we do long, long, Father, to praise your name. Also, in this morning, as we gather together for worship, 
For you are the Holy God, the Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We acknowledge your greatness. We acknowledge your goodness. We acknowledge your grace, your mercy, and your love. We confess our sins and ask for the forgiveness of our sins based upon the propitiating sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray not only for the forgiveness as that is promised within our text of pardon, but we pray too for the washing of sin. We ask that you would renew a right spirit within us, especially underneath the use of the means of grace within this day. Father, we express our thankfulness for all of your good providential gifts. And as we have gone in this week for a national day of thanksgiving, uh, we reiterate our, our appreciation for your faithful providence and how you abundantly give us all that we stand in need of. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for, for life, for life that can be lived with hope, for life that can be lived with purpose. And we ask especially that those who perhaps struggle to embrace that hope and to recognize that purpose might especially be ministered to in this day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the salvation that we have, both the present salvation, but also the promise of the, the future greater realization of that salvation. And we thank you that this Lord's Day is a foretaste of that eternal rest that is laid up for all of those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask for a blessing upon this day that we might physically be renewed and also that we might spiritually be renewed. And we pray for physical renewal and strength, especially for those who are sick. We're thankful, Lord, that Larry Gullion could return home, and we pray for continued strength. We pray for Lila as well, as uh, this family has been through quite the ordeal of a lengthy trial. Uh, bless each member with that which they stand in need of day by day. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon others who are shut in, whether at home or in a place of care. We pray, Lord, that you would visit them today and bless them also with encouraging word from the Scriptures. We think of those who mourn the passing of loved ones, whether close relatives or more distant relatives. We pray for comfort for those that mourn. We think, too, of individuals who perhaps are struggling with besetting sins, habitual patterns uh, of sin and we pray, Father, that you would grant liberation and freedom uh, from sin. Not only do we pray for those who are struggling, but we also rejoice with those who will mark notable birthdays in the week that lie ahead. We think of Marv Desord and Marge Van Haften and also Marilyn Hartman. We're, we're thankful for the long life that you have blessed each one of these saints with. And we pray that we, along with they, uh, might acknowledge your goodness as they commemorate birthdays. Father, we pray for this church and for your church wherever she finds herself manifested. We ask that by the Spirit's work through the Word that there might be increasing maturity in the knowledge of the, the Scriptures and in the expression of faith, that there might be simple godliness, that there might be fervent hope, that there might be a consistency between that which we profess and that which we also express in our lives. And so we pray, Lord, that as we turn our attention to the reading and to the preaching of the Word, that your kingdom would come by the work of the Holy Spirit. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. This morning, our song of preparation, to which we now turn, uh, is taken from selection 243. We'll stand, if able, as we sing stanzas 1, 2, and then 4 and 6. 1, 2, 4 and 6 of 243. Afterwards, you may be seated again.
This morning's Bible reading is taken from Jeremiah 23. We'll be reading and also considering, Lord willing, the first eight verses. If you're using the Pew Bible this morning, you find Jeremiah 23 on page 896. And we're taking a break from our exposition of the book of Ecclesiastes to have a few sermons on an Advent series. Uh, Boys and girls, and perhaps also others of us, a reminder that the word Advent means the arrival of a notable person. Uh, We use Advent especially in connection to the arrival of the most notable person, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, We speak of a first Advent connected with the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also speak about a second Advent connected with the final return of our Lord Jesus Christ, when at the end of human history uh, he appears personally, visibly, gloriously. Uh, In the Sundays leading up, although we don't strictly follow the full liturgical calendar, for example, as the Roman Catholic Church does, uh, but for the Sundays leading up to uh, Christmas, we thought it appropriate to look at some Old Testament prophecies uh, about the first advent or about the coming of this most notable person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we want to, in that context, read and also consider together Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 8. Hear now together the reading of the Word of God. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them, and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord." Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Thus far for now our reading from the Holy Scriptures. A congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of better days has often been a motivating factor, a source of encouragement to press on in dark days. The hope of better days is oftentimes a beacon of light uh, to those who walk in darkness. This is true for us personally. Uh, This is also true in the Holy Scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, as the people of Israel from time to time walked in very, very dark circumstances. Nevertheless, the prophets especially were at times sent to offer uh, a beacon of hope as they pointed forward uh, to better days that were to come. We have such a prophetical oracle before us in Jeremiah 23, uh, verses 1 through 8. In the context of darkness comes Jeremiah with a word of reality concerning the circumstances that the covenant people find themselves in, but also with a projected focal point of hope for the faithful remnant of God's people. And so we want to look at this text this morning uh, with this central theme, the coming days of a saving king. The coming days of a saving king. We'll notice, first of all, the need for the saving king, and then secondly, the work of the saving king, and then thirdly, the result of the saving king. Jeremiah is a prophet. He speaks that which the Lord gives him. And as he prophesies, he foretells. 
He foretells events, and He foretells them uh, with certainty and with reliability because the words ultimately are not simply His words, but are the words that the Lord has given Him. And He speaks about the coming days of a saving King. And there was and there is a desperate need for the saving King. First of all, consider the historical context briefly of this prophetical oracle written around 600 B.C. by Jeremiah, the wailing prophet. The northern tribes of Israel, the ten tribes in the northern part of the kingdom, have been carried off by the Assyrians. Uh, Babylon has come and has conquered Assyria. So Babylon is now the world empire moving forward with unparalleled military strength. And Babylon is about to, or is, carrying off the southern tribes, the tribes known as Judah. And so in summary, we might paint the historical context as right in the midst of the exile of the covenant people of the Lord. The days in which there is spiritual apostasy. And apostasy is a word that we frequently use, so it's good to be reminded of its meaning. Apostasy means to fall away from. And by and large, the covenant people of the Lord have fallen away from a proper understanding of who the Lord is and a proper life in connection to that understanding. In essence, uh, Israel, as well as Judah, have fallen away from the worship of the one true God. And so they are a destroyed people. The historical context, you could say, is that of the people of the Lord being destroyed. Notice that that's the verdict that is given by the Lord Himself in the opening of verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who destroy the sheep of my pasture. The Lord is acknowledging that His covenant people, His sheep of His pasture, are destroyed. They're destroyed primarily through the sin of idolatry, the sin of serving other gods, of worshiping other gods, of following other gods. And many of the spiritual leaders of Israel and Judah had sought to assimilate the, the foreign gods from the surrounding cultures, and, and they had built their idols, and they had established their, their places of worship, the, the high places, and, and they had committed the sins of idolatry that brought about a spiritual destruction. And along with that idolatry, there was a rampant immorality among the covenant people of the Lord. Immorality in areas of human sexuality, because many of the surrounding gods of the nations were worshipped allegedly by gross acts of sexual immorality. Also, there was injustice that had become very common and prevalent among the covenant people of the Lord, with those in positions of leadership oppressing what we might call uh, the common person. And the Lord reflects on what has happened among His covenant people, and He says, the sheep of my pasture are destroyed, and they are scattered. They are destroyed, and they are scattered. Again, verse 1, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Notice verse 3, the Lord says, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them. Notice just for now that the Lord has driven His covenant people out and scattered them in what we call the exile. They are being removed from the promised land by way of foreign enemies and by way of military conquest, as they experience judgment and chastisement. And so the historical context is in the midst of the exile, as the covenant people of the Lord find themselves being destroyed through apostasy and being scattered by way of exile. And there is a certain connection within our own day in regards to the general condition of the church, because there's evidence that the church is, to a certain extent, destroyed. You can 
read of statistics. You can observe facilities of worship that once were filled with worshipers that are now vacated. You can travel through Europe or read through Europe about how a church community that was once vibrant is now almost non-existent. From a certain perspective, the church is destroyed and scattered. Where did the people go that once filled those pews, that once filled those places of worship? Where are the numerous covenant wanderers who were baptized, catechized, who once sat in pews underneath faithful preaching but now are nowhere to be found? Now, rather than just bemoan the current condition of the church, what this ought to do is confront us with the reality that what we need is a saving king. A saving king. And yet, in connection to the need for a saving king, the Lord also gives a covenantal indictment. Verses 3 and verse 2 balance divine sovereignty and human responsibility. In verse 3, the Lord says, I have driven them. But notice in verse 2, therefore thus says the Lord, God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock. You have driven them away. So verse 3 says the Lord drove his people away. Verse 2 says that the shepherds drove the covenant people of the Lord away. And there's a balance here between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. But the moral culpability, the moral responsibility lies upon the spiritual leadership of the covenant people. And the Lord charges the shepherds with a dereliction of duty. Shepherds most likely refers to all of the office bearers, you might say, in the Old Testament dispensation of kings, of prophets, and of priests. Uh, you can look, for example, if you scan down uh, verse 11 in chapter 23, the Lord says, For both prophet and priest are profane. Yes, in my house I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. Therefore their way shall be to them like slippery slopes. In the darkness they shall be driven on and fall in them. For I will bring disaster on them. The year of their punishment, says the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied by Baal and caused my people Israel to err. Also, I have seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery and, and walk in lies. They also strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns back from his wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to me and her inhabitants like Gomorrah. Notice what verse 2 says about the shepherds of Israel. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil, the evil of your doings. Habitual, gross, blatant sin among the leadership of the covenant community had caused dark days of apostasy, a destruction of the covenant people, and a scattering of the covenant people. And this should be a solemn warning to all of us, but especially individuals in positions of leadership. You can think of what Matthew 18, verse 6, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ say, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The Lord, and to put it maybe in contemporary, contextual setting, the Lord says, you know what? It would be better for an office bearer to be taken to the mile-long bridge over Lake Red Rock and a massive chunk of concrete to be fastened to him and to have him thrown off the bridge into the lake than for him to lead one of the little ones of the Lord astray. And that's why James 3 verse 1, my brethren, 
Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Because at times, serious moral failure by leadership within the covenant community causes destruction and scattering. And it also reminds us of our need for a saving king. A saving king is what is prophesied. And in our second point, notice the work of the saving king. The first thing we want to emphasize about the work of the saving king is that it is a sovereign work. I, I was struck as I, as I made my way uh, through this scripture passage this week by how many I wills there are in the text. And just a reminder, when you read scripture, pay close attention to the grammar, especially to grammatical repetition, because that repetition is not just a weakness. You know, sometimes we repeat ourselves in speaking, uh, and we get perhaps docked down a, a, a bit in our grade for public speaking. But when the scriptures have repetition, it's by way of emphasis. So notice how many I wills, I wills, especially just look at verse 3, verse 4, and verse 5. But I will gather, the Lord says, the remnant of my flock. Verse 4, I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. And verse 5, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch. The covenant community is an apostasy. They're, they're destroyed. They're scattered. The spiritual leaders have compromised the fidelity of the faith. They're living in rank and morality, but the Lord sovereignly intervenes and says, but I will do something. And, and that's the direction of our hope. It's not that we are going to do something, but that the Lord is going to do something. And, and what is the Lord going to do? The Lord in in essence, is going to remember his covenant, and he's going to realize his covenant. Covenant basically meaning a, a promise or an oath that, that obliges the Lord to do something. So, verse 5 especially, uh, it all centers upon what we call the covenant of grace, especially as that was historically established with David. And reference would be to 2 Samuel 7, uh, verse 16, where the Lord says to David, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So the Lord had promised to David an eternal kingdom, an eternal throne. And along with that, subjects or inhabitants within that kingdom, and along with that, all of the blessings and all the benefits that, that come along with that kingdom. And yet, if you look back in Jeremiah, verse 20, verse 30, rather, of chapter 22, it would, it would appear, it would appear that that covenant promise ha has come to a dead end. So, verse 30 of chapter 22, thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless. And the reference in verse 24 is Coniah, the, the last apparently descendant of the Davidic line in the kingdom. Exile's coming. Babylon's coming. They're, they're, they're going to drag off the king of Judah. And, and so the Lord is saying, write this down. This man will be childless, a, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore of Judah. So verse 30 of chapter 22 just confronts us with this question, what about that promise? What about the promise of 2 Samuel 7 verse 16 in light of Jeremiah 22 verse 30? It would seem that the tree of the Davidic covenant has been cut down and, and, and nothing is left but a barren stump. And that's when the Lord comes and says, I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king. A king shall reign. The Lord would establish and continue his covenant. And we are reminded this morning that the Lord's promises cannot fail. It's impossible for the Lord's promises to fail. 
And so our hope and our confidence, even as we recognize at times the reality of apostasy and the reality of being scattered, we come with the exercise of faith and we look into the Holy Scriptures and we say the Lord will do something. And the Lord indeed has done something through the saving work of a righteous king. Now notice the emphasis here upon righteousness. Verse 5 is mentioned twice. Uh, Verse 6 is mentioned once. I will raise, verse 5, the Lord says to David, a branch of righteousness. And that branch shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Verse 6, his name will be called the Lord our righteousness. And we recognize that time hastens on and and we could spend a considerable amount of time on unfolding this whole idea of the righteousness of the Lord, the righteousness of the branch, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for our purposes this morning, just allow us to reemphasize the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Apostle Paul also says in Corinthians, is our righteousness. When you look at the kings of Israel, even the good kings, so to speak, always had their moral failures. And as history went on, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, many of them were characterized by gross unrighteousness. But the Lord Jesus Christ, perfectly righteous in himself and in all of his actions. We refer to this as the act of obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, perfectly fulfilling every single requirement of the law. And also then, he is our righteousness by way of his saving work by way of an imputation of righteousness, by way of a declaration of righteousness, by way of the righteousness that comes uh, through the forgiveness of sins, and by the transfer of a perfect fulfillment of all of the law. You see, this is is the, the essence of Christian hope. The Lord, our righteousness, That that phrase, that that strikes down any concept, any idea, any tendency, any temptation to to legalism or or to moralism or to self-righteousness. The promise isn't, we ourselves righteous. No, the the heartbeat of the the faith is, is this, note, the Lord our righteousness received by faith. That is the hope of the souls of the Christian. As also expressed, for example, in Luke 1, verse 74 and 75, Zacharias' prophecy, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And just notice verse 4 as well. The Lord says, I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. And and what these shepherds do, and what they must do, and what they should do, these, these faithful shepherds, these shepherds that are beneficial to the sheep, these shepherds point the sheep to the righteousness of the Lord, to the righteousness of the king, the Davidic king, who prospers. And, and, and this is what the church needs. The church does not need individuals to come and say, well, I can do this, well, I can do that. We have this program, this novelty. Well, what the church needs more than anything else is individuals who in humility but also with a note of confidence uh, will stand in the pulpit and stand in the eldership Uh, who will visit in the hospitals, who will visit in the homes, who will visit the families. The church needs individuals in the catechism classroom, in the Sunday school classroom, and in the Bible studies, who will point humbly to the Lord our righteousness and say, He is the King. 
He is our hope. He is our confidence. He is our answer. He is the remedy. And sadly, what you find in, in, in many, many, uh, an example within the contemporary church is the church is so introspective, fixated on itself. It's all about me, all about my needs, my wants, my desires, my abilities, my capabilities. That's a recipe for disaster. It's not about me and it's not about you, it's about Him. The Lord, our righteousness. He is the one who will save His people. Notice the result then in our third point is that of a gathered community. A beautiful description of what the Lord will do in verse 3. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and I will bring them back to their folds. I will gather and I will bring them back. A remnant. Remnant means a, a small piece of, of a whole. The covenant community have been scattered, but the Lord says, I will bring back a remnant, and I will establish them within the promised land. This promise found partial fulfillment, for example, in the days of Ezra, the days of Nehemiah, when individuals of the covenant did return back to the promised land and, and did begin to rebuild you can think also of examples of the remnant of individuals who were there just prior and just after the first advent, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can think of, for example, a, a Simeon and of an Anna, living, looking, hoping for the consolation of Israel, the comfort of Israel, the confidence of Israel. And, and as they came in and with the perceptive eyes of faith, as they saw the Davidic king and his days of infancy, as they saw the mystery of the incarnation, as they held, in the case of Simeon, even the child in his own arms and, and recognized to a certain extent the Son of God, the Son of Man. They recognized salvation had come in the Lord our righteousness. And, and notice that the Lord says that this remnant will increase they will be fruitful, verse 3, and increase. And the Lord Jesus Christ says the same thing in a few of his parables, most notably perhaps the parable of the mustard seed. And a mustard seed, boys and girls, so small you, you can't hardly even see it with, with your eye if you held it in your hand. The Lord says that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Very, very, very seemingly insignificant, and yet you plant it, and over time, not just over one night, but over time it grows, and it continues to grow, and it continues to grow. And so is the kingdom of God within our own hearts, but in this context, in the sense of numerical growth. Now, it's not overnight, instantaneous, dramatic, numerical advancements, but think as the years go on, Individuals come to hear the gospel. Individuals come to hear the faithful proclamation that the Lord is our righteousness. And individuals come to receive that truth in faith. Individuals profess that faith. And the kingdom grows and it grows and it grows. All the way until you have the final realization of that glorious picture in the book of Revelation of an innumerable company of redeemed gathered around the throne of the Lamb, proclaiming, in essence, the Lord our righteousness. Christ shall have dominion over land and sea. And the prophets, they spoke truth. They evaluated their contemporary culture correctly. But they always had this note of hope. You can think, for example of Habakkuk 2, verse 14, where Habakkuk says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
May I ask you, do you believe that? Do you believe that the day is coming in which the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea? May I also ask, do you long for that day? Especially as we live in the context of a covenant community that by and large and certain extents is quite similar to the days of Jeremiah. Not only is there a gathered community, but notice that the gathered community will give an exalting testimony. Verses 7 and verses 8 recognizes what we call the, the history of redemption. God has one plan of salvation that was promised and began to be executed already in, in Genesis 3, verse 15. But as this plan of redemption progresses, uh, there's greater and greater clarity and, and greater and greater works of, of redemption. And, and, and so verse 7 and verse 8 say that after the beginnings here of the realization of, of the branch of righteousness, after the Davidic king shall, shall reign and prosper, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, uh, that was a great work of redemption. That was a great work of covenantal deliverance when the Lord brought his people out of the land of oppression, out of the land of Egypt. But what, what Jeremiah is saying is that work of redemption, as important as it was, as foundational as it was, as powerful as it was, that day of redemption will be eclipsed by an even greater work of redemption as the history of redemption continues. Verse 8, as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. And we began by emphasizing, maybe not emphasizing, but identifying that when we, when we speak about advent, which means the appearance of a notable person, we speak about a first advent and a second advent. The first advent being the, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, his conception, his birth. The second advent being his physical return, his glorious return, his triumphant return when he comes to judge the living and the dead. And, and here's, in closing, uh, a point of application. There's always, there's always a danger around Christmas time of only emphasizing the babe in a manger. Almost everyone is okay with a baby in a manger. Now I know there are some uh, blatant atheists who would be hostile to such a depiction, but, but most people are okay with a baby in a manger. But just be reminded that the first advent leads to and demands the second advent. And the next great act of redemption, the next step in redemption, is the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he returns, then ultimately, the promises in this passage will be perfectly realized. Things such as verse 6, Israel will dwell safely. In those days, Judah will be saved. Saved from sin, saved from judgment, saved from all of their enemies. Because verse Five, verse 6 cannot just be pulled out and applied to a certain ethnic group in a certain geographical location in our current day. No, the promise of verse 5, the promise of verse 6 needs to be understood and interpreted in light of the entirety of the New Testament scriptures as well. And with our eyes of hope and faith and love fixed upon the heavens, 
we know and we are reminded and we long for the day in which the Lord and the people of the Lord shall dwell in their own land. And so even as we read this prophetical oracle, our hearts ought to be saying, Lord, come quickly. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And as we have attempted to explain it and to expound it, we ask, Father, for clarity in our minds to understand it. And we ask for faith within our hearts to believe it. We ask that you would give us hope, never a hope that ultimately is based in ourselves, but a hope that is ultimately always focused upon your work, your sovereign, saving, redeeming work in your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in all of our activities as a church family, may he be lifted up. And as he is lifted up, may we be drawn unto him. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our song of dedication, to which we turn at this point in the service, is number 325. If Abel will stand as we sing all three stanzas of 325, then afterwards you may be seated again. The morning offerings that we now present will be received by the deacons for the seminarian fund. After that collection is taken up, uh, we'll stand as we sing our doxology, uh, the one stanza this morning of selection 226.
Before the benediction, I want to encourage uh, Jack and Adri to exit the sanctuary after the benediction, and, and then also congregation, if you would extend to them, uh, to Jack especially, uh, the right hand of fellowship uh, in connection with his public profession of faith uh, that he's made this morning. But now, people of God, receive the blessing of your Lord and go together in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God with the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.